morning, everyone. Yeah, my name's Katie. I am the Programme Officer from Community Share Scotland. Um, we are part of the Development Trust Association, who some of you might have he um, heard of. I'm joined by um, Pauline Hinchin from Scottish Communities Finance. I'll just let Pauline say a quick hello before I start sharing my slides. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to hearing all your thoughts today. Thanks, Casey. So I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to share my screen and just start kind of getting into the presentation and what we're looking to cover off today. So, yeah, thanks very much for coming along um, this morning uh, to this dem democrat democratising finance session. It's a kind of introductory session on local democratic finance, as I say, with myself from Community Share Scotland and Pauline from Scottish Communities Finance. So just as a bit of a session outline um, for what we're going to cover today, uh, we'll kind of be just doing a wee bit of an introduction to what local democratic finance kind of means. Um, it's kind of a new programme that we've launched recently um, between the two organisations uh, with DTAS. Um, so yeah, we can just uh, dive into a wee bit more of what we mean about that. And um, we're going to do an introduction to community shares um, and community shares funding. And then Pauline will um, cover off uh, an introduction to Scottish Communities Finance and Communities Bonds Funding. And then we'll look at some kind of case studies and then what's next for the programme going forward and the kind of support that we're going to be um, offering to groups and the kind of research that we're doing uh, kind of around the wider kind of local democratic, democratic finance um, work that we're doing. So what do we mean by local democratic finance? And I think this is something that, you know, we're quite happy for this to be an interactive session. If anybody themselves get any thoughts, please feel free to, you know, put your hand up or put some thoughts in the chat. Um, and Polly might want to dive in as well. But um, essentially, democratic finance is looking at the kind of money that's sort of already within communities um, and where community groups can source that from rather than the kind of traditional institutions like a bank or a building society. Um, mm and putting that towards sort of community projects uh, and initiatives. Um, and democratic finance is a way to kind of allow communities to essentially invest in your organisation for small and social kind of financial returns. So um, that's, you know, why we're going to cover off kind of community shares and community bonds as the kind of two primary kind of models that we deal with at the moment um, and that we're kind of then looking to expand on with our kind of wider um, programme. It's a way to create social capital. So it means that people will, you know, invest in a community initiative or project because it's something that they believe in um, and it creates really good engagement within communities. Um, and it essentially kind of locks in a, a customer base for the organisation. And that can mean that not only are people maybe investing, but they're then going to say if it's a, something like a community shop, for example, if they're investing in that um, organisation, they might also be more likely to shop there. They might also be more likely to spread the word about the organisation um, and perhaps maybe volunteer. So it's kind of looking at, you know, the other kind of benefits that come from people investing within a, a kind of new organisation or enterprise run by a community group. Um, and provides patient and affordable finance to organisations. So I think what we you know talk about often is that with this with these kind of means of uh, funding projects, they can provide sort of long term sustainability to, to an organisation, and it means that groups aren't having to necessarily rely on the kind of traditional grant funding, um, which we you know, all kind of know at the moment, especially is is becoming quite scarce and quite hard to come by for groups, and it's like ever more kind of competitive. Um, and it encourages communities to be agents of change. So really looking at, you know, what's going on in their community, you know, they're the ones on the ground, you know, what can, um, you know, seeing what the kind of needs are and being quite reactive to that in a way that kind of larger private kind of, um, you know, enterprises and businesses aren't maybe able to. It establishes kind of local so local citizen investor networks. So kind of, you know, looking at what the people that are already within your community, you know, who are they um, and, you know, what what's already who are the people that are already there and can they kind of spread the word and kind of start to create a network of people who potentially have money um and are looking to kind of invest in sort of social enterprises and things like that and it can kind of help to grow that network and it also keeps money essentially circulating around that community itself so as i said if it's say a local community shop or a pub or some other kind of enterprise it's about creating that kind of circular economy where people are actually, you know, invested within that community, spending their money there um, and essentially yeah, keeping that money sort of circulating um, around there. Pauline, well, I don't know, do you have any other thoughts you want to add to that or is that all fine? Yeah, I think you've summed it up quite well. Okay, okay thanks. <laughs> um, so 
I'll just move on and I'm going to talk a bit about community shares um, finance and then Pauline will talk through uh, community bonds. So, um, yeah, an introduction to kind of community share Scotland. So we're a team of three who work within the Development Trust Association Scotland, who are the, um, a, a member-led organisation for development trusts in Scotland, working on kind of regenerative uh, projects throughout uh, Scotland. Um, so our kind of remit is we are funded by the Scottish Government and the National Lottery and we essentially raise awareness of alternative finance models. So primarily community shares, but we also have done some light touch support work around um, crowdfunding. Um, and then obviously we're going to be expanding that through this local democratic finance programme that we're currently developing. We deliver training workshops and events, but also our kind of bread and butter in our day to day job is to provide direct support to communities who are looking to raise um, finance through uh, community shares um, uh, finance. The support that we offer, so we can really work with groups from a kind of early stage um, where they are starting to think about potentially using community shares. And that can involve, it says here, up to six days of free tailored consultancy, but to be honest, um, when we're working with a group, it could be six days, it could be six months, it could, you know, there it we're pretty flexible with the um support that we offer because every group that we work with is going to be different essentially. So we try not to be too um uh, rigid in that support that we offer. And that kind of free consultancy covers a range of things from business planning. So is the you know is the enterprise of the initiative potentially viable? Is it going to be income generating? Um, and looking if, uh, at the kind of facts and figures of whether that um, enterprise actually could be um, eligible or you know able to support a community share offer. We also work with groups around community engagement, so those kind of initial community consultation pieces. So um, looking at you know what the project is, how engaged the community are, do they want it? And then that can also carry through to the kind of um, latter stages of a community share offer, um, you know, in terms of, you know, getting the community on board, uh, having launch events, things like that. So that's something that we also support with. We can also support groups with their governance because in order to raise um, a community share offer, you have to be a certain um, a governance structure, which is a community benefit society and I'll go into that um, in a few slides time so we um, can work with groups in terms of um, their their governance and we also then in kind of the latter stages we work with groups on their share offer documentation and that is again something I'll talk about in a few slides time but that is essentially your kind of prospectus which outlines your business plan um, how you've engaged the community the kind of vision for the project and that um, the kind of a uh, investment details all of that stuff is then laid out in a share offer document that then goes out to the community and out to investors to see if they, it's something that they want to to get involved with and then in addition to that we also um, can provide a micro grant of up to five thousand pounds to groups and that is essentially to cover things like marketing costs and um, you know in terms of maybe printing a share offer document putting together a promotional video having a launch event but it can also cover things like specialist tax or legal support as well and we um, work with a kind of wider network of community shares practitioners who we can kind of pull in to provide that kind of extra support um, if need be and that again that's all free support that we provide to groups uh, through their community shares journey. I'm hoping this video is going to play because I, I think this gives quite a nice overview generally um of you know the kind of benefits and the um of kind of community businesses and community enterprises it's, it's essentially a sort of a utopia i suppose for community business um, and hopefully it just kind of sets the scene a wee bit um, more around um kind of community shares finance and kind of essentially community ownership at the heart of all of this so hopefully it plays if there's any issues with the sound just let me know in the community of bonnie Park, Things are a little different. The local shop is owned by its customers and stocks local produce of the highest standard. Residents also own their local pub, so all the money they make goes back into the business. They've just invested in a new beer garden. An energy cooperative has installed solar panels throughout the town, so its members can benefit from clean energy at a reduced cost. A community transport hub encourages greener travel through electric bike hire, a car club and electric charging points for residents and tourists alike. Across Scotland, 
more and more places like Bonnyburn are realising that through community ownership, it can be greener, friendlier, happier places to live. When businesses are owned and controlled by the communities they serve, all their efforts can go towards making them the best they can be. If you think your community could be more like Bonnyburn, free support is available to help set you on your way, whether it's help setting up your organisation, developing your business plan, building support for your idea, or raising money through Community Shares. Community Shares Scotland, the Plunkett Foundation, and Cooperative Development Scotland can guide you through every stage of your journey. So what next? Whether your community business is still just an idea or you're already up and running, get in touch to find out more. So I think hopefully that kind of gives a wee bit of an idea of um, the kind of ethos behind um, uh, community shares, which is essentially, you know, that kind of idea of com real community ownership. Um, so in terms of what community shares actually are, they are essentially a way for um, uh, communities to raise money for activities and enterprises that basically serve a community need, but also have an income generating idea. Um, and community ownership is really at the heart of it. Um, they are a wee bit like crowdfunding, but unlike crowdfunding where it's a, a donation that you give and you don't necessarily expect anything back, maybe you would get some sort of reward um, as part of that. Community shares are actually an investment, so you're going to put your money in and potentially receive some interest back um, at some point once the, um, the enterprise is kind of up and running and running profitably. And as the, the, the video demonstrated, they can be used to finance a whole host of different community initiatives from pubs and shops, community buildings, housing projects, renewable energy, sports, food and farming enterprises, and, and lots of other things in between. Um, essentially, I think we always say if there's a kind of income generating element to the project, then potentially community shares can be used to, to finance them. And just some key facts about community shares. So as I mentioned before, they can only be issued by a community benefit society or a cooperative. And I'll go into that a wee bit later on. Um, and the, the people who invest, the shareholders, they become members. So each of those members is a, has a, a one, one kind of vote. And that's really regardless of the scale of the investment that they put in. Um, someone could buy one share at £25 or somebody could buy 10 shares for £250, but they are only ever going to have one vote each. And that is a way to kind of keep it democratic and ensure that um, those who put more money in don't have more say Um Shares are withdrawable as well, so um, if it gets to a time where a person who's invested wishes to take their money out, that, that is um, possible. There are quite a lot of kind of safety nets that we that can be put into the share offer documentation that kind of outline the kind of um, rules for that, because I think that's a question we're quite often asked by groups who are thinking about um, raising or putting out a share offer is, well, what if somebody puts in a chunk of money and they, they want that back and we maybe can't afford it? Well, we would always kind of say to groups to build that in and say potentially shares are only withdrawable after a certain amount of time, say five years. There may be only a certain percentage is allowed to be withdrawn um, as well. So it's just to kind of build in those kind of um, those kind of safety nets for groups so that people aren't taking out lots of money. But I think what we see with shares is that because they're essentially a kind of social investment, it's actually relatively rare that people want to get their money back. I think once people have put their money in, they're quite happy to to leave it there Um especially if they're going to maybe be seeing a little bit of interest going forward. So, um, yeah, so investors, investors can be incentivized through tax relief and also interest. So typically that's between kind of two and five percent. Um, and, you know, it's not huge sums of money that anybody is going to be getting back. Um, and again, it kind of comes back to the idea that it's a social investment and people aren't doing it to go, you know, they're going to get lots of money back out of it. But um, it's just a way to kind of incentivize people to actually invest in the project. Um, and also community shares can be uh, really helpful to attract further funding. Um, a lot of the groups that we work with, and um, we've got a statistic I think on my next slide, tend to attract funding from, say, the Scottish Land Fund or some of the other bigger fund funders as well. So it can be really useful to kind of um, demonstrate to, to funders that you've got an active and engaged um, community who are willing to put their own money in, which then means that funders are also willing to kind of... Um, we often match fund or or give grants towards um the 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 project that 
groups are looking to, to take forward. So just a little bit about the Community Share Scotland story, story so, far, so far. So the programme launched in 2014 and since then we've supported around 58 share uh, offer launches, um, which has raised a capital, uh, capital amount of over £19 million pounds and attracted over £27 million pounds in further additional funding for groups, which is which is really, really great. Um, and at the moment we're sitting at about 17,000 kind of local and community investors, which is great because it kind of, again, demonstrates that kind of uh, engagement with, with the model um, and that it's kind of growing and that people are actually interested in investing in these kinds of projects um, within their own uh, communities as well. And just some uh, sector kind of findings. So we uh, work quite closely with the Community Shares Unit um, down in uh, England. They're kind of our equivalent uh, down in England. So every year they put together a Community Shares market report. Uh, and that de basically demonstrated this year that in terms of resilience, um, enterprises that have run Community Share offers are, are doing really well. So up to 92% of them are still trading and they have really strong community, they have really strong member engagement. Um, be that, you know, again, people... Some of these people are going to be volunteering, you know, shopping in their local shop or, uh, you know, visiting their pub, you know, really kind of supporting it in other ways than just investing. Again, it's really good for attracting funding. So 40% of um, Scottish share offers have been match funded by the Scottish Land Fund. And uh, a third of um, the groups that we've worked with so far have had a uh, UK community ownership funding. And in the last few days alone, two groups that we are su currently supporting to launch share offers have had around 300,000 and I think 250,000 from the UK Community Ownership Fund. So um, managing to attract like a, you know, a sizable chunk of their, their kind of funding package and community shares are going to just kind of support that. I mentioned, mentioned this before, but community shares enables groups to kind of take that direct action. So, you know, they are using this kind of finance to, you know, create a number of kind of like really diverse kind of business um, sectors and models so that they can tackle local problems, which is really encouraging um, because essentially, you know, people are in their communities, they're, they're on the ground, they're kind of seeing what, you know, is needed there. Um, and it's, you know, using community shares to kind of uh, help fund that is is increasingly being used uh, or increasingly being used. And it also has a kind of wide geographic spread, which is meaning that others are being inspired to do the same. It's in, you know, creating a kind of peer to peer support system. There's a lot of community learning exchanges happen and it's given that kind of local access to expertise. Um, a kind of example of that at the moment is we work quite closely with the Plunkett Foundation, who are an organisation that kind of support rural businesses. Um, they're kind of experts in that and they've over the last year or so been running a Scottish community pubs uh, kind of networking um, group and that is a way to bring together kind of early stage groups but also groups who are kind of further down the line, groups who are kind of right in the midst of going through, uh, taking on a pub into community ownership, running a share offer. And it's just a way to create that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning and support network. So that's a really good example of that. And that's, you know, Scottish community, uh, Scottish community groups using community shares is becoming um, more and more kind of uh, popular um, over the last, especially over the last kind of couple of years. So just a wee bit about a kind of, you know, essentially what is a community share offer and what that journey looks like. And I think we always say that no journey looks exactly the same because some groups will need more support than others. Some groups will be further ahead by the time that they come to us. But essentially a community share offer is a time bound campaign with, with a target raise amount for a specific project. So a group might be looking to take over their local pub. They want to raise 250,000 and they want to do it within a six week time frame. And there's kind of four key pillars that we look at with them um, as part of that. As I mentioned before, community engagement and consultation. And really that goes from the very, very early stages of, you know, do the community want this? Is it something that they um, want to get involved with? Um, and then, you know, that in community engagement, we always say to groups should last really throughout and, you know, keeping the community very aware of everything that's going on, being transparent. Um, and making sure that everyone's still on board, they know when the community share offer is going to launch, um, and really just kind of making sure that everybody's on board, um, and is you know engaged with what's what's happening. Because if they're engaged, they'll be more likely to invest when the time actually comes. Um, as I mentioned, it's governed by a community benefit society, 
and that's something that we can help uh, register and go through all the kind of um, ins and outs of how that works. Um, it's informed by a business plan, which again, we can support with. And then the share offer document is created to kind of promote the offer. And there's a wee kind of image there of just a kind of example document that we've worked on with a group. Um, and I'll discuss their project a wee bit later on. The actual community share offer document is kind of um, marked against the criteria which we call our community share standard mark and that's been created by the network of community shares practitioners throughout the UK and it's basically awarded to share offers that you know are deemed to ma meet the kind of national standards best practice for community shares um, and the assessor will review the share offer document business plan the application forms and the government documents just to make sure that everything's above board makes sense the business plan looks sound um, and uh, it's a way to kind of offer peace of mind to investors. But it's not necessarily a stamp of, you know, you should absolutely invest in this. That's not something that um, we, it would be encouraged, but it's just a way to, you know, give investors that peace of mind that the document has been externally reviewed um, by someone who's been kind of removed from the project itself so they can look at it with fresh eyes uh, and offer any sort of comments um, before it, the, the share offer um, launches. So just a little bit more about Community Benefit Society. I think I mentioned that you do have to be a Community Benefit Society or a cooperative. Um, to be honest, we tend to work more with Community Benefit Societies, which is well, probably more go into that uh, today. Um, it's also known as a BENCOM, so you might have heard of that. And essentially, a Community Benefit Society is a legal form for organisations that want to operate on a democratic, open, two-tier membership basis, kind of like a SKEO or something. Um, and it's the clues in the name, the community benefit is, you know, some the purpose of the enterprise has to be, you know, that they're going to be serving the, the, the community as a whole. So essentially any kind of excess profit once the, the, the enterprise is, is making a bit of money should be going and be reinvested kind of back into the um, community. An example of that is a, a hydro project that we worked with several years ago. They're now making um, enough money that basically they are funding a, a development officer post in their local trust. They are um, putting money into a local kind of renewable, other renewable energy projects. So it's just things like that, like what can a, a group put the, the kind of excess money into um, that's going to benefit the, the kind of community as a whole. Um, you, the, the group can be a community of geography, interest or both. And as I've mentioned before, they're um, they're still eligible for all the kind of major third sector funds, including the Scottish Land Fund, who've um, funded a lot of the groups that we've worked with, either to take over the asset um, and the groups have maybe raised the capital to refurb or, or something like that. It's also eligible for community asset transfer and community right to buy. Um, the It then ha has an asset lock on it. So essentially, if the, say, the... It was a community building that was taken on to be run as a hub, but the group then decided that they didn't or they couldn't run it anymore. That asset would be locked and it would still need to be used for community purpose. As I mentioned, it's not for profit. The profit would need to go back into the community it can, and it can be charitable. And finally, um, it's registered with the Financial Conduct Authority. And uh, when I mentioned that we kind of take a group through the, the steps to that, uh, that's one of the kind of biggest things that we'll do with a group um, is to take them through that process. So just a little bit about a share offer document and the kind of launch itself. So essentially the share offer document is the kind of call to action. It's the it's the vision, it's the um we've got all the kind of key facts in terms of what the 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 minimum investment that a group's looking for. So again, I mentioned you know, it could be something like two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, it could be twenty five thousand pounds. It's 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 very, very different. We've worked with groups from Again, twenty five thousand pounds right up into hydro projects that are looking for you know over a million pounds. So it really can vary quite a lot, and within that groups can set a kind of minimum investment, and that can quite often be important in terms of getting that kind of local buy in because you know you you don't want to set it at too high a target that's really going to deter people in the the local area from uh, investing. So it could be maybe be something like two hundred and fifty pound for people living within. Uh, sorry, twenty five pound for people living within. A certain postcode and then maybe 25 250 pounds for people living out with that and quite often especially with say a funder like the Scottish Land Fund within their kind of criteria they quite often state that 51 percent of the investment has to come from within the community 
are kind of again defined postcode and 49% has to come from can come from out with that and that's just a way to again kind of maintain that real kind of community ownership um, um, and then you know it, that it's in the hands of the community and but recognising that a lot of groups especially for some projects might not quite manage to raise that full amount from the community um, in their kind of immediate community essentially so oh, yeah, it'll contain the target raise. It'll also contain the the key dates for when the offer is is live, which can essentially be from four weeks to six weeks. We tend to say maybe not too much longer than that, just to kind of keep the the energy and the impetus up because it can be quite a long process and um to get to the launch date. So uh, we kind of say to groups, you know, don't want to get burned out. So keeping the 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 time frame relatively short is is a good idea. It'll have all the information on how to invest, um, whether it's a kind of platform that groups are using, something like Ethics, which is a kind of ethical investment platform, or whether they want to do it on their own, maybe through their own website, with them um, just kind of a, a ability to take payments on there. There'll be a, a potential launch event, which is just a, a way to get the group, uh, the community together and really um, kind of sell the share offer to them. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, there's a maker grant to cover um, a lot of the costs that's involved with a lot of this stuff. So I think I've spoken quite a lot about community shares. So I'm now going to hand over to Pauline just to chat a little bit about community bonds. Brilliant. Thanks, Casey. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along today. So I'm here to talk to you about community bonds. And my name is Pauline Hinchin, and I'm the director of Scottish Communities Finance Limited. And a lot of what I'm going to say is relevant also to what Casey's going to has just said. So I'm going to cut out a lot of it. So you'll probably find I've only got about maybe four or five slides because there is a lot of overlap between community shares and community bonds. So I'm really going to highlight the differences um, rather than the similarities. Thanks, Casey. Yeah. OK, so Scottish Communities Finance is a community benefit society. So we're registered with the FCA. We actually registered literally a year before COVID. So we're relatively new on the scene. And um, we have done about seven share of our community bonds offers since then. Um, and basically the difference between ourselves and community shares is that we work with third sector organizations um, to rate all third sector organizations to raise affordable patient repayable finance I think that's the thing is uh, you know from the beginning you have to recognize you're taking on debt when you take on community bonds and um, but we do provide free support to organizations interested in community bonds and we hold our hands through the process so again what do we mean by community as Casey said community of place and geography but it can be your membership it can be your associations it can be your customers or your clients or the parents of your clients. It can be your stakeholders. This is what we mean by community. And one of the first things that we do when we're looking at this is we sit down and we try and articulate who are the communities that are relevant to that offer when it comes to community bonds. Because often there's more than one. Um, that, and we kind of look at different messaging that has to go to different, um, different communities relative to that organization so there's a whole rake of them that are out there that we kind of say right okay we think they're interested in what we're doing and we think that they'll actually buy a community bond okay so as i say community bonds are a vehicle for securing repayable long-term patient debt long term can be anything from five years to 15 years depending on the project there's no prescribed um, um, period of time. It just depends on the project. The organizations we work with can be BENCOMs, but they do not need to be BENCOMs because the way we have set up is that we actually lend them our BENCOM status. So we actually issue the bonds and give them the money. Um, and in that way, it means that organizations who have pre-existing structures like KICS or SCIOs, Company Limited by Guarantee, if they don't want to become a community benefit society, they don't need to, to do the democratic finance. And I think this is where the bonds and the shares dovetail quite neatly together, because it means that we're trying to make sure that as many organizations within the third sector have access to democratic finance. 
big change from what Katie was saying is that the investors have no ownership or governance responsibilities. So literally, unlike the share offer, which is you're trying to bring people in as owners of the shop or the whatever you're you're doing, the shop or the harbour. In this case, all you're doing is saying to the communities, we need some money. Can you give us some money? You know, they don't have any ownership. They're not equity, which is what shares are. But equally, they don't have any governance, so they can't come. You can invite them along to an AGM if you wish, but actually, they actually have no responsibility in terms of membership. Um, as Casey said, similar to shares, you have to do a community bond offer prospectus, very similar to some of the images that Casey showed and some of the information. So the opening date, closing date, how much you want to raise, you know, the, the maturity date, the interest rate, all of those are in there. And as Casey may have picked up or not, at one of the slides that Casey showed when she was looking, giving you examples of prospectus, is that there's a big warning in all of these that your money is at risk because whether you're community shares or community bonds, you're coming in as an investor and your money is at risk. And you will see that in any of the big mainstream banks. There's nothing unusual about that from the point of view of any, anybody who has any kind of financial um, products, whether it's savings or loans or mortgages, you will see that warning written everywhere. And it's the same here. Similar to community shares, when we talk about community bonds, there isn't a secondary market. You know, these things can't be sold on the FTSE 100. You know, this is very much about local locals actually investing. So there's never a point in time where people think, oh, I'll buy the, the bonds now and then I'll send it on the bond market. It just does. It, it can't be done. Um, but it is unlike the shares whereby communities choose at what point um, to make the start re repaying share owners. In our case, there's actually a fixed repayment date. So it could be, you know, the 1st of April, 2033. So basically it's fixed and the money must be repaid at that point, including the interest. It's suitable for small or large, again, very similar. You know, we've done 17 and a half thousand pounds, 200,000 pounds, 2 million pounds. It's, it, it's not prescriptive. It's very bespoke. And, you know, whether you want to raise 5,000, 50,000 or 500,000, you know, it's what you need for your community to make something happen or to realize the vision of what you want to do. It's suitable for most of types of economic development. So for example, we have a scenario at the moment where the organization did community shares to actually buy the asset and are doing community bonds to extend the asset and to extend the business activity within it. So you can blend it really well, really well. The shares and bonds can be blended. And as Casey said, bonds can be blended with grants. So you may get a percentage of a grant and you need to raise the money for the rest. Um, we do charge fees. Um, and that is based on the amount of money raised. So basically, you know, if you, um, if for example, you want to raise £10,000, then the fees are very proportionate. If you want to raise a million pounds, the fees actually are, are predominantly for the costs of actually the external cost of doing a bond. So if you want to produce um, a prospectus, for example, and you, you can do it yourself or you can get somebody to do it, and therefore, we will have to pay that money and therefore we will charge you for that later on. Some people want videos, they want whatever, the whole shebang. Some people want to keep the fees as small as they possibly, um, as small as they, they possibly can. And they do a lot of work themselves. We do a lot of work with them. Um, and one of the things we do is everything comes through the, um, is the SCF website. So if you're doing a bond offer, you will have a very specific page on the website with a very specific address, web address. The applications will come into us. The PayPal is on there. The Bax is on there. So we take on a lot of that kind of like a platform role. Um, and we don't charge for that. As I say, we just charge for the direct cost association, if there is any association with doing the bonds. But we, we work with organizations. We try and do as much ourselves. Um, 
you can do more than one bond offer at a time or um, you can do a bond offer at different stages. So you might have a project that has a phase one, a phase two and a phase three. So you might do one for phase one and then three years later, you might be ready to do phase two. So you might do a second bond offer. Um, there's nothing stopping rewards, you know, in that sense, it's like a crowdfunding, you know, a donation based crowdfunding. So a reward could be, you know, if you invest in our chocolate making facility, we will send you a box of chocolates on your birthday, you know, every year for the first five years, that type of stuff, because you're actually then creating your client or your customer base in terms of, you know, once they, they, they've tasted your product or once they've come into your shop or once they've come, you give them a tour around the renewables facility that you developed or once you've shown them around, um, you know, the um, you've given them a half price, you know, entry into the theatre for a year, you know, you're building a customer base going forward for your actual trading activity. And again, to reiterate, we're only interested in investors that are interested in making the organization successful. That's why we kind of focus in on a community because the assumption is, which we know is correct, that actually a community is interesting, interested in what's happening and wants to see things happening. And actually, if they have some money, want to put money in to make something happen. So in that sense, we're trying to keep things local within the case of community bonds, because there's no ownership or governance, certainly if an investor, if somebody's daughter lives in New York and she grew up in your community and her mother says, well, have you heard about this? She wants to invest, she can, because actually it makes no difference where they're actually based. But we do find that it tends to work better whereby people have a vested interest because they live or work in that community. Um, the other thing that is really important is that we cannot prioritize investor returns over the sustainability of the project. And by that, I mean, you know, you might be looking for 100K, somebody might come along and say, you know, I'm willing to buy 50K worth of bonds, um, but I want 7% or I want 10%. Actually, if we've done our due diligence, which we do with the group, and we discovered that the sustainability of the project can only pay 2.5%, then we actually have to say no to that because we cannot use, the investors can't collapse the long-term sustainability of the community project or the community asset. Okay, so we did some research on um, some of the community bonds that we have done. And here's the research um, in a kind of GIF form, I suppose. So we had, we went out to two community bond investor groups and we had 45% return response rate. And that was from 228 individual investors. And by the way, just to say that in, when it comes to bonds, and I think shares as well, investors can also be organizations as well as individuals. So your local butcher or your local housing association, or you know, they can come in as um, bond um, investors and share investors. So it's not just, so when we mean individual investors, we mean in, each each bond application or applicant rather than individual as in each person. But most of them were people is the reality. Um, and 88% of them said they were motivated to invest locally. And 83% of them said they were motivated to invest for social environmental goods. 76% of them had never invested locally, probably because you know what we are doing around democratic finance is relatively new. It mightn't be new in our world because community shares have been around for a long time. But to people who are outside our world, to your neighbours, you know, they've probably never heard of this before. Um, and 55% have never invested socially. And again, to reiterate and give confidence to you, 80% plus, actually I think it was 82 or something, thought the bond information was easier to, uh, was easy to understand. Because we are talking about people that are not necessarily high net worth individuals you know they don't consider they're like us we don't consider ourselves to be investors so the information can, has to be right it has to be understandable and the fca is very clear that it also has to highlight the risks like your money's at risk is is mentioned in the bond document but also it has to be a combination of look at the wonderful social stuff you're going to get from your investor and it isn't all just about look at the return because it's highly likely that the return actually um, 
is only on a par with what they're getting from their savings accounts at the moment. Um, so you're really selling the social aspect as much as, you know, we can give you a small financial return. But it's important that it's laid out in a way that, you know, we can all understand it and we're not particularly technologically or investor savvy. Um, and actually 58% were more interested in the organizations because once you invest in something, you're putting your money where your mouth is, I think, and suddenly, you know, 58% were never aware of these organizations. They then invest and suddenly they want to know how they're getting on. They want, they're turning up to meetings. They're getting involved as, on the board as volunteers because they know that they have to make this work if they want to get their money back. So the engagement in the social capital actually stems from an initial, it could be an initial 50 pound um, investor in the bond. But the point is that people suddenly kind of take notice. And I think that's an important thing in terms of social capital. And then 81% said that they actually would invest in community bonds again, which I think is really heartening for all of us going forward in terms of um, the confidence that people get. And I think that confidence comes predominantly from when people actually see something's happening. So they invest and suddenly they realize they now own the shop, for example. Suddenly they realize actually this works and yes, I think we would come back in and if they want to extend it, if they want to do something else, we would reinvest. Um, we would reinvest again. Next slide, Casey. This is a comparison table that we've drawn up to try and understand the differences and the similarities between bonds and shares. So in community shares, what legal structure? And this is really important because what the Community Benefit Society or a Ben Comp status gives you is predominantly the right to raise investment. And that's why when you're doing a share offer, it's also linked to ownership. But for community bonds, if you have an existing structure, you can be a Ben Comp and you can do community bonds. But if you don't, you know, we're trying to put in place an option for you if you don't want to change your legal structure or add a, leg or add a community benefit society onto your existing structure. So it's important that everybody has a chance to do democratic finance. Again, the admin process is medium to high. We do a lot of hand-holding, and as Casey said, so does community shares. Um, that is not to underestimate. You know, we need this, you know your business and you know your community. So the level of engagement in terms of what we what is needed from you, you know, what is the business model, you know, um, we will do due diligence, what are the figures? Um, you know those figures better than we do, um, you know, your community, the way they work, what's going to appeal to them. So there's a fair bit of work, and that's before you actually get to the actual offer. Um, period itself, you know, when it's a lot of social media, a lot of press, a lot of radio, trying to get this out into the um, into your community to make people aware in order to get them to buy a bond or a share. Um, for, so for the investor or um, considerations, you know, do they get voting rights? Do they get ownership? Do they get a membership? Yes. Community bonds, no. It's just debt, give us your money, literally. Whereas in community shares, it's equity by its very nature means you have an ownership stake in the proposition. And um, do they get their money back? Yes, in the case of community shares. And as Casey said, there's caveats, which is very much determined by the progress of the organization and of the trading entity. So there is an ideal, you know, that you will try and start buying back 10% of the shares within a certain period of time. And if things are going really, really well, you might buy them back earlier, you might buy back slightly more. If they're not going so well, you might, you might buy them back till two years later and you might buy them back in a much smaller percentage. But they, in the case of community bonds, they do get their money back and they get it. their exit strategy is a fixed maturity date and at a fixed rate of interest. And that's really important. And I think to come back to the thing about the investors as well is that actually the the um, when it comes to the interest rates, you know, in the case of bonds, when the maturity date is up, we will write to people and we say your maturity date is up, and we 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 offer them 
um, the choice of actually donating their investment back to the organization, which in this case is not us, it's it's ye, it's our community partner. And you would be surprised how many people actually do that. You will be surprised to say, yeah, we will give them back the the um the bond investment and the interest. Some of them want it all back, and we have to be prepared when we set out, we have to be prepared looking at due diligence and looking at the period of maturity date. We have to be prepared for everybody to say, I want my money back and I want all the interest back. But we know, and community shares is similar, we know that when it comes to it, a lot of them do actually donate the money back to the organisation. So as much as possible, we try and encourage organisations to have gift aid to be prepared for that if they don't already have it. And then basically, do the investors receive interest? In our case, they definitely do but it's optional there because actually there was a period when interest rates were very, very low. You might all remember that until this trust government, you know, interest rates were tiny. And in some cases, a bond offer can go out with no interest. You're just promising the capital. But, the, but now it's become increasingly obvious that you kind of have to give an interest rate in the case of bonds anyway. And um, that interest rate really has to be competitive to what they're getting in the market. So predominantly what they're getting from their savings. Right now, I'm getting 1.15% on savings. So you would be looking at an interest rate that is at least equal to that. But the point is you're getting money much, if you're getting money at 1.5%, you're getting money very, very cheap. Um, so there is an optional, but I think the expectation, certainly for bonds, is that you're trying to encourage people to become a citizen investor, to give them the money back with interest so they'll come back in again the next time that there's a bond offer or there's a share offer. Um, I think that's all. Is that me, um, Casey? Yeah, I was just going to yes. do, just talk. Oh, yes. Me. We've got some case studies to talk through. So I think the first one yeah. is yours, Pauline, if that's yeah. right. So, so the case study is Linus Google Solar. Um, you probably can't read this very much, but basically we worked with them Linlithgow has a very high, well above the average Scottish um, hours of sunshine. Um, so we did phase one with them, which was a very small pilot, which was to look at the local facilities, sports clubs, community centres, and try and work with them to actually put solar panels on the roofs in order to reduce down their energy costs. And this is before Ukraine, remember, this is before all the energy costs went sky high. Um, but actually, because a lot of them wanted to do net zero stuff, but actually they didn't have the capital. So we worked with the Development Trust to actually raise the money with the Development Trust to put the solar panels on the roofs. We then extended that. We went into a phase two because suddenly we got a lot more interest from a lot more clubs. Um, and so we did a second bond offer. And then basically we're now doing a much larger third bond offer in relation to um, phase three. There's likely to be an element of community shares in that as well. But really it's just to say, you know, you can actually start small because you might never have accepted debt before. You might be trying to test a model or a proof of concept and you might need a very small sum of money. That's fine by the time. And then you can grow from there. There's not like just one bond offer and um, it may be that in the second phase you can get access to grants but maybe you get 80 percent and you need 20 percent you can brand you can blend in democratic finance at that stage and um, i think that's everything from now i'm sure we can yeah. discuss these um case studies if anybody has any questions we're going to allow about maybe half an hour um, and of course katie and i are always available afterwards if anybody has any specific questions and want to explore any of the options in shares and bonds you know off offline in a more one-to-one -one capacity that would be fine yeah I've thanks, got a few, uh, no, thanks Pauline I've got a couple of we I won't go too far into it I've got a few case studies but I re realize it's probably been a lot of listening so um, yeah I'll just really briefly talk about a couple of um, community share offer uh, case studies as well so um, Bridging Farmhouse who some of you might have heard of I think they are actually a SCAN member as well um, they um, 
they, I think they were one of the first uh, community asset transfers that City of Edinburgh Council did, and that was to take on an 18th century farmhouse kind of on the outskirts of the city. Um, and it needed quite a lot of kind of redevelopment work. So I think they got the the fun, some funding from a uh, National Lottery, Robertson Trust and H Historic Environment Scotland. So the share offer itself was actually to kind of... Um, you know, make that uh, the kind of difference up so uh, to enable them to refurb the space. So they raised about £70,000 from 404 members in 2018, um, as I said, to restore the, the, the building. And they have a real kind of ethos of sustainability uh, and kind of caring for people, place and planet. That's kind of at the, 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 the core of what they do they stand for they run a lot of classes and activities kind of outdoor and play space education they have a community cafe which uses um, local produce and surplus foods uh, run by their local volunteers I think at the moment they're establishing or have established some allotments in um, spaces as well and just in terms of their kind of future kind of viability as a, an enterprise to kind of as we you know we've talked about that kind of a community benefit kind of side of things and um, they're using uh, events in room hire um, and sustainable events particularly kind of weddings and things which can quite often be quite um a uh, resource a uh, heavy uh, they they want to kind of make that a bit more sustainable and again the the kind of money that they they make from these running these kind of more profitable um, uh, sides of the business will then go back into their their kind of community outreach and their community work that they're doing as well um glengarry forest cabins they are based up in uh, invergarry the initial day where uh, they are part of glengarry community woodlands so they're attached to that a organization and they um own their own woodland but we're making some money from it in terms of you know supplying kind of um wood for fuel and things like that uh you know, had the forest school activities various kind of uh, clubs for um children and adults but they really wanted to look at how they could make the land that they had um, more sustainable going forward, how they could then, uh, you know, create an enterprise on it, essentially, that would make them um, some additional money as a way to tackle some of the other kind of bigger issues that they were facing. So they have a lot of issues in terms of kind of short term a uh, holiday accommodation, lack of affordable housing for people, local people, lack of jobs. So after a kind of extensive community consultation, they basically came to the conclusion with the community that looking at a, um, creating a kind of a, a com, you know, holiday accommodation business would be a really good use of the, the woodland, but instead of, you know, building, you know, houses or whatever, they would actually create off the grid eco cabins, um, really sustainable, um, and that the, the money that's kind of raised from them once they are up and running, I think, with, they're actually in the process of just putting the cabins in at the moment. Um, I think they'll be able to start trading next year. Uh, those cabins will provide a kind of sustainable income for their parent charity, the the Woodlands. But that'll also be used to kind of um the, the profit from those cabins will eventually go towards those kind of community initiatives that I've mentioned in terms of creating sort of small affordable crops for people. Um, and the bigger kind of vision is to 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 hopefully raise enough money and um, profit wise that they'll be able to start thinking about some affordable housing. But it's also going to create several jobs in the area as well. So yeah, it's it's quite a kind of full circle one for them in terms of um using the woodland to basically create a kind of more sustainable income for the the community as well and they managed to raise 279,000 from 176 investors which sounds like a lot of money um, and it is the again they they did just they had to raise about 51 percent of that from within the community so they did really extensive kind of um community engagement a lot of one-to-one -one work with people to kind of drum up that investment but they did also go out kind of nationwide on the ethics investment platform which also enabled them to kind of tap into the wider um kind of uh, investor network that already kind of exists in the UK in terms of people who are, are keen to invest kind of socially uh, as well. So yeah, they did really well to, to raise that investment and they should be up and running with the cabins from next year. And just um, lastly, dig in Bruntsfield as a community-owned green grocer in the Bruntsfield area of Edinburgh. 
they said they were kind of created as a kind of counter to a larger supermarket that had wanted to take over um an old Peckham's shop uh, within the area. Um, so they wanted to kind of counter that um, and still have that kind of local kind of shop um, within the area. So about 10 years ago, they raised £30,000 to complement their other their other grant funding. And they've been running successfully since then. Uh, and they have a kind of focus on local produce, um, smaller supply chains. Um, they also um, do things like kind of reducing food waste with their yesterday's bread scheme, reduced basket schemes. Um, but at the moment, we're actually working with them because they are due to launch a second share offer because they've kind of realised that after 10 years, the shop needs a little bit of love. It needs um, a bit of a refurb to kind of bring it up to to, to speed in a kind of modern way, but to kind of fu uh, future proof it um, going forward. And again, just in terms of um, their kind of community benefit side of things, they do a lot of outreach in local schools just around kind of healthy eating food workshops um, and that kind of thing. So that's what their kind of community benefit side of, of their work um, covers off. So just lastly, um, so I've probably talked way too much, um, just a little bit, just more generally about our local democratic finance programme. So as Pauline and I have kind of detailed, community shares and community bonds really are at the moment are, and have been the kind of main focus for the programme. We also have done some light touch support around crowdfunding. And again, if anybody wants to, to get in touch, if they're thinking about a potential crowdfunder that's something we're always happy to advise on but going forward as part of our kind of research and development uh, strands of the the program we're looking at several things in terms of legacy and philanthropic giving so what's already you know are there potential um, uh, opportunities for trusts and organizations right. to really benefit from uh, people who might have money looking to pass it down in wills and things like that um, and keep that money in the local area. So we're looking into that. Uh, local loans and underwriting, community lotteries, we're doing a research piece on that at the moment. Common good assets and funds, community benefit funds in terms of uh, looking at, um, at the moment, obviously there's quite a lot of money around from hydro and wind schemes. So how can that money be filtered back into the community? How can communities asset um uh, how can communities basically uh, access that? And we're also looking into community shared ownership. So these are all things that we're kind of looking at going forward. And again, we're happy to to discuss with any groups who are um kind of keen to learn a little bit more about that as we basically build our own knowledge around that as well. Yeah, just to clarify some of the stuff that's in development. Yeah, I suppose um. A large part of what this is about um, certainly is about trying to find the money that's sitting locally and actually, as, as Katie said, and actually bring it to the fore for use by local organisations. But a lot of it as well is trying to find money that is going to take the risk rather than people in your community taking the risk on, on not getting their money back. You know, what is the role of philanthropy in actually taking the risk? So even if things go wrong, because I think we now know with COVID things go wrong, that actually it's not the community that loses the money. Somebody somebody actually will has taken the risk and therefore the money pays the money back to the individuals in the community. You can imagine in some community that's really important in some of our poorer communities and more disadvantaged communities. So the whole idea of local loans and underwriting is very much based on who can take a loan. So, for example, SCF has a loan guarantee scheme with the National Lottery. It has to be applied in very specific circumstances in terms of some of the communities. And if something happens to, you know, the shop or whatever, you know, the extension or, you know, the sky falls in, you know, and things doesn't the to the trading doesn't pan out the way it was in it intended, we can take that loan and guarantee and use it to repay back local people. But it is very limited to very specific communities where the loss of 25 or 50 pounds might be a lot of money. But one of the things we did want to do was not disempower people by saying, oh, you know, you know, you have to have so much money to invest because you might lose it. We want everybody in the community to feel that if they want to contribute, that they can. But there is a risk, and therefore, how do we do the risk? One of the things we're doing as well is we're working with local authority at the moment, and they're doing stuff like underwriting um, risk. So if, if the organisation raises 
80 percent and we've done everything we can to get to get the hundred then they'll come in and they'll actually supply the other 20 percent or indeed if in certain circumstances if the community mrs smith from the community buys one they'll buy one as well to try and make sure that the, the money comes in and the and the development happens and we get everything over the line the community lotteries i think it's important to recognize that um this isn't about promotion of gambling but in a lot of cases this is whereby a community may want to buy an asset they may have got you know 80 percent of the money and um, could we do a one-off community lottery to raise the 20 percent would uh, people be willing to buy a lottery ticket more than buy a bond or a share so we're exploring that and doing research but certainly we're not talking about losseries as in week in, week out. We're talking with predominantly one-off to make, to bring the, the, the rest of the money that's needed to, in order to make, um, the, to make the development happen. The common goods, assets and funds. I mean, I think people are aware of common good assets, but actually local authorities have lots of common good funds. Currently, they get tied up within the council and we're talking to a local authority at the moment about trialing. Can we bring some of the good funds into the democratic finance space? Maybe they could fund you know, the cost of running a bond if there's a fee application. Maybe they could actually blend it. So maybe they could give you 20% if you, if you raise the other 80%. The community benefit funds is very much around you know, the renewables and actually you know, how do we use funds that our community, that communities get from um from a local wind farm how do we bring that into the space how do we create legacy funds that go on much longer than the 12, 15 years or 12 15 years that the benefit funds come into and then of course community shared ownership particularly within renewables what is the role of democratic finance in bringing together many communities to actually invest directly into a wind farm in order for them to realize profit. The whole point about all of those is about trying to give communities legacy funds to allow them to do good stuff, that they control the money, they're not looking for grants, they decide that they have a pot of money that comes in each year, and actually this is how they want to spend it. It's something that people in more rural communities are kind of familiar with, but maybe in the central biot less familiar but the point is how do we maximize the benefit of all the wind turbines that are happening onshore and offshore for communities in the longer term so that they actually have their own resource of money to do with what they want to do to meet their social community aspirations thanks katie well thanks pauline